Um, well, hello, uh, my name is Alex DeMaio. I'm a student from the aerospace department at the Combustion Laboratory. Um, I chose this topic on thermoacoustic instabilities using Ricky tube because um, in our lab there's a lot of a lot of work being done in, on how to predict uh, these thermoacoustic instabilities that may happen in combustion systems. If they establish inside, your your whole engine can be gone within minutes or even well within minutes. But um, so this is a this is a topic that uh, is is being under study for like many students in our lab, and um, this is not exactly what I'm working on, but this seems appropriate for the prop for the purpose of this project. So the model setup is quite simple. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Ricky tube phenomenon. You have a tube. So imagine this is a metallic tube and um, you have some heating element. Some people use Bunsen burner to just show how it works. Um, you can find videos on YouTube of this and everything. Um, if, you, if you light up inside the tube, you can get resonances and uh, the actual flame might affect the, the air that's inside it and you can get frequencies, like very large resonant frequencies. Um, so what I'm, what I'm trying to do is get this model uh, and then show some of the results. So here we have a tube of length L and we put the heating element on some position in it and you have some small mean flow. So the model equations, um, the first, the first equation is the momentum equation, uh, Navier-Stokes momentum equation without viscosity. Uh, we consider very, very small mean flow. So this is linearized. We, we, uh, we, uh, the physical equations are actually linearized that we start with. And this is the energy equation, uh, including the heat element. This is gonna act as a driver for our, for our physical equations. One of the biggest problems in our community is what, what does this look like? We, we, have, we, we don't have a, a very good idea, like we have some idea of what it looks like. It's usually a function of, of fl uh, fluctuation velocities, pressure velocities, but that are, some of our professors, uh, they, they, they showed that it could be even a function of um, um, equivalence ratio of the mixture. So the actual phenomenon in combustion chambers are, is much more complex than this one. This one is just to see how, how the coupling occurs. This one I took from a thesis, um, so this is a model that only takes into account the fluctuation velocity at the heating location alone. No pressure coupling is, is necessary and uh, these, are all, th these are all physical parameters of our problem like length of the tube, the temperature which we use to heat the element, area and, and so on and so forth. Uh, oh, there's a time lag because the thing is the time lag, since we're, we're talking, like when this heats, we're going to have expansion of the, ve the velocity fluctuations is going to change. So the whole, the whole tube is kind of like the velocity that is established inside the tube is the same thing. But it can, e it can either get dr driven or damped by, by the heating element. So there are positions where you might get, where you might get strong coupling and there are, and there are positions where you where it just gets completely damped out. So uh, the tau is the tau is used to to model what happens with time lag because I'm not completely sure, but like depending on how pressure is established inside it, uh, even with uh, the time lag can be used to to model like the effect, like the difference in time from um, from one situation to the next, that's how, I've, that's how I see it. Like the time lag is based, you can, if you didn't have any heating element, the pressure and the velocity would be 90 degrees out of phase. Once you include the heating element, you can get differences in, in the time lag of the velocity. But for, for, for the plus I'm gonna show, there's, I, I, I just set it all equal to, to zero. So, oh yeah, one interesting thing, I was talking to one of the professors, initially I thought that one spatial symmetry would be to take this XF and place it over here and we'd get the, this, the same situation. But it turns out that the symmetry for this to occur is that if this is in one fourth of the position, we'd have to not only put it here, but code. Instead of heating element, we'd have to take energy out, then we'd have the same situation. So this is a symmetry, I don't know, because now we have a, a symmetry in the parameter also, which is the temperature that we're using to heat. So that's something that I'm trying to 
to think more and, and how to do this. So we have a set of PDEs and I'm trying to pass, it on, pass them to uh, ODEs. So one assumption, um, they mentioned the Galerkin expansion. We use this function, these cosine functions, because we, we're considering open open tubes. So the pressure, uh, the velocity is going to be maximum at the ends of the tube. So the sine functions are really good to, to, to use to model this problem. Um, based on the previous equation, if we, if we substitute that U prime back into that first acoustic equation, we get a straight off result for P prime. And then we take these two results and substitute into the energy equation with that model and we get, we get the, the set of, uh, of ODs. Here, this is the projection on that delta function that we had for heat release because it's only in a point of the tube. So what I'm trying to solve are these equations. The main problem that I had is it depends on the number of modes we, on, we want to use. Um, based on the thesis, uh, the author uses 10 modes because after the 10th one, we're within 5% of the numerical results. Qualitatively though, we can use only three modes and we still get the same picture. Um, my approach right here is not uh, quantitative, it's basically to see how the solutions work. So I used three modes and uh, this is the actual, this is the, the, the nonlinear term that, that um, makes the equation not explode, I guess. So initially what I did is I, I fixed parameters and, and tried to see if, if in any initial condition I could get some limit cycle to appear or something like just trying to see if the equations worked. So I did get for very similar initial conditions this uh, like this one was the thing is the initial condition was less than 5% difference and we still get like these limit cycles but this was the only one I found though whether I use 10 modes or whether I use 3 this is one, the one I have. The, I'm only showing you plus with velocity fluctuation because the pressure fluctuation looks similar and uh, physically would be the same thing, I guess, for the for the for this study. Can you go back to the equation? Yes. And J is n is ten hundred five. So in this case, I use n equals three. I only use three because. I, after, after, the, the, after analyzing the data, I couldn't get a hold of what's, what was happening to the equations and, and then I compared the, the results for, for n equals 10 and n equals 3. Qualitatively, they are very similar. The limit cycles, they're all the same, they behave the same. So I plotted a lot of stuff, on, so this would give three second order ODs. And then, then parameter, you know, xij, kj, that's that's something oh, this is modeled. This is all. This is modeled. Oh, this one is actually. I don't even know why they go through the trouble of using this because this is just j pi. So this is really like we're we're going through the frequencies here. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Another interesting thing is this is also used as this. So this is where the coupling occurs between the ODs. Here, yeah, for, for this term, I also use three, so I use three for all of them. So in here you have 801, 802, 803, and on the left side, for example, just 801. And then you go through the, through the whole set of equations. Um, so this picture here shows the limit cycle from another perspective. I took the... Um, this one I applied the other stuff that I was doing, like I did a Hubert transform and tried to see if I could get the cycle in terms of velocities, like with 90 degrees phase, uh, phase shift. So on the, y, on the Y we have 90 degrees forward and on the X we have the, the actual velocity. And it starts out like the initial condition keeps a little in the, inner, in the inner stable circle, but something happens that pops out to this outer limit cycle here. So the amplitudes here are like 2.5. 2.3 or 2.5, and here slightly less than one. Um, but then I took the eight approach. This was all velocity. So, but the thing is, I'm solving for eight, so I'm trying. I'm trying to understand what I'm looking at, really. So I did the solution, and then I plotted each of these zetas. And on the next slide, I'm going to show you what I what I try to see in that limit cycle. Um, the largest contribution comes from the first from the first data and then the second and then the third respectively. And you can see here on, on this graph like the, the frequencies 
the frequencies of each of each mode and I don't understand why this is only a function of time I don't understand how they coupled in the spatial domain because this is where the frequency is changing and not here but apparently they kept like the same ratio like two and then one and uh, three then two then one um, from this I did the same thing with for the limit cycle and I got this weird limit cycle um, I don't know what to, yeah? So, <laughs> there is a limit cycle, like it, it, this is very familiar to us. So. It looks very similar, like the, the, the problem is, this is the only limit cycle I found, and no matter, like I, I had initial, absurd initial conditions and it got sucked in into this. And then like I was, all right, what do I do next? I did a point section on the zero, like the pointing in the X and one pointing in Z. So we could see the evolution of it, basically. The, the, the plane where I just cut uh, the, the Z axis, like the, the, the first plane, one, zero, zero, didn't give me much. But the Z one, it get, I, I, I feel like this is the evolution. Like as we start the solution, you get points propagating. And this picture doesn't show well, but if, if you looked at the graph, you have a larger cluster of points here, which is the, 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 the rest of the limit cycle. Like it, it starts out near and then it goes poke in the, the point cross section and it, it, it expands to the, to, the, to the last portion of the limit cycle. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to... This is all math, but I don't know how, to, how, how this could give me any insight on the, on the mechanism itself. Because the whole model was done, like, like I told you, we have a huge problem on how to actually specify this Q. How to specify this. This is a very big issue. And we have to resort to experimental data and all, and all that. So I don't know how much of this is actual physical, uh, the, the solutions I showed. But uh, I'm up for any suggestions. And uh, anyone that uh, has more interest in this, you can, we can look some of these references. And that's it. Any questions?